Make sure we get all those on. Yeah, I want to test this real quick. Make sure there's no feedback in between the two. No, it's a different um, frequency. Yeah. Okay. But let me just make sure. It was kind of loud. Just getting our mics going. Testing, testing, one, two. Okay. You can sit wherever. It got quiet, so it must be time to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for coming this evening. Uh, my name is Eric Keck, City Manager. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get things kicked off tonight. Uh, this is uh, a very unique situation, obviously, that we have in our community right now with the vacation of a seat of the member of a city council. And by the city's charter, the, the prescriptions are that uh, interested applicants apply and they have an opportunity to state their case. Uh, with the public as well as with the current city council and the city council will make a decision. So the format of this evening is as such. Each of the candidates will be called up to provide a three minute introduction uh, about themselves, their desire to uh, serve this community and desire to serve on the city council. After each of the eight candidates now have had the opportunity to give their opening statement, uh, then there'll be time for the public to just mingle with the, with the particular candidates. Interviews will also be conducted this evening, so we, we're going to try to keep this moving uh, so that we're right on time because the first interview is at 7 p.m. Obviously, the public is more than welcome to remain in this room during that time. The only thing we would ask, obviously, if there's other conversations that are occurring, please take them into the, to the atrium area so that the uh, respect of the interviewee and the council can conduct their business here. These meetings are being broadcast. We're streaming these, these interviews as well. We're making this a very transparent process. So if you happen to miss any interviews, you'll be able to go home and, and onto the meetings portal for the city and watch the interviews as well. So again, thank you to uh, the public for coming, but also thank you to those of you who have applied uh, for this particular position. Uh, I know that you don't take this lightly, and I know that the council will take this very seriously as well, uh, as it's a very important position. So having said all that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call up the first uh, candidate to introduce herself, and that's Hillary Lenz, and she, Ms. Lenz, will have three minutes to uh, introduce herself, and I have the timer. Okay. <laughs> so I'll try to stand where you can see me, and I'll let you know how much time you have left. Okay. But please come on up and introduce yourself. Thank you so much. I didn't know I'd be first, so uh, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, my name's Hillary Lenz. I'm thrilled and honored to, to be a candidate for District 1 City Council. I'm here because I want to be a bigger part of the community building that's happening in Englewood. And uh, the reality is that, that Englewood is changing. And uh, with our great team of council members, uh, I want to make sure that the best parts of Englewood come along with that change. Um, I bought my house here because of Englewood's history, because of its present, um, and because of what I know that it can become. Uh, which is a community that sees past some of its differences and keeps striving towards the common goal to make Inglewood its best. Um, I'm an executive at a small organization, A Little Help, or a nonprofit that helps um, neighbors connect to help seniors thrive. Uh, as a program director on a small team of five, uh, we get a lot done. We serve over 600 seniors uh, with over 1,000 volunteers. Um, so there's a lot of really great teamwork and work that we're doing in the community on a regular basis um, throughout the state, actually. And I'm passionate about building those connections between neighbors of diverse ages and backgrounds. Um, and I've seen how meaningful those relationships really are. Um, my boss at A Little Help is also the senior pastor at Mayflower Church on Acoma, um, where I do the bookkeeping and budgeting. Uh, in both those organizations, I've really seen neighbors of all ages coming together to thrive in the community, um, and that's really what has brought me here today. Um, I live this mission in my personal life as well. I count among my best and closest friends uh, an eight-year-old, a 96-year-old, um, and I have friends of every generation in between, um, so it's really dear to my heart. Um, many of the neighborhoods that our young professionals are moving into, they're moving into them because they're full of other young professionals. Um, and that's just not what I am. I want to be in the mix. I want to be connecting with my neighbors of all ages, which I find um, really, really valuable and to know them. Um, 
and I want to strengthen those neighborly connections in Englewood. Um, I know I have a lot to learn. I have the desire to listen, to bridge, and to serve. Uh, and this is where I'm coming from as a leader. Um, I'm here to be an advocate for and a champion of Englewood uh, to continue strengthening our community, and I will work really hard to pursue the best interests of our city. Um, as many of you know, uh, may know, Englewood's mission is to promote and ensure a high quality of life, economic vitality, and a uniquely desirable community identity. I want to be part of the fulfillment of that mission. Uh, I've, been, I've never been one for the sidelines, and I would be honored to bring my passion and the skills I've developed uh, throughout my career to this team. Uh, I'm here to work for you, and I'm ready to listen and to bridge those gaps and to serve. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, and I really look forward to serving in in the future in whatever capacity that is. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lenz. Next, I would like to call up Dana Liebert. Hi, my name is Dana Liebert, and my family and I moved here from New York City four and a half years ago. So, yes, I am a newcomer. Um, but we came seeking a better quality of life, and we intentionally chose Englewood as our home. And we chose it because of the quiet, safe neighborhoods, the friendliness of people we had met um, in the neighborhood, uh, the close, the bike rideable proximity to my husband's job at Swedish, and the great dog park of Jason Park. Um, and we plan, we bought our house saying this is our last move, we're never leaving. So as someone who wants to never leave, I'm invested in Englewood's future, as we all are, and I want to bring my skill set to the City Council and work together to plan for a sensible and clear-visioned growth. I want Englewood's future to be one in which we benefit from new residents and development without pushing out longtime residents and business owners or losing the neighborhood's um, characters that we love. I want a plan that keeps Englewood a safe and healthy place to raise children, which is what drew, drew me here. And I'm deeply interested in working to further strengthen Englewood's economy, our environmental sustainability, and our cohesiveness as a community. And I see that as a challenge while we are in such um, change with people like me moving in and people who've been here for a long, long time. And our neighborhood's changing. And the neighborhood I grew up in in New York City um, I was born in 1965, so I grew up during the bankrupt time in New York, and I remember when things started improving, and then it went too far and became unrecognizable from where I grew up. And people like my family and the people I grew up with all got priced out. Um, and so I think we, we probably, there are ways Englewood's gonna change that we can't even imagine right now. And we need to just have a very clear vision of what we want it to look like, what we want to maintain, and what we can improve. So um, my qualifications, I have a very diverse professional background. I worked as a documentary producer for 10 years, uh, a small business owner for four, and for the last 11, as a parent advocate for my son who has a disability. <laughs> As a producer, I manage fast-paced, complex productions. I've managed budgets, and I've been a successful problem solver. <laughs> um, as a parent advocate, I've been an effective um, negotiator, often in adversarial situations, and gotten things um, and a level of cooperation that people have told me is unheard of. Um, so to wrap up, I have the experience from my professional background and the skill set to be the listener, the problem solver, negotiator, and budget manager that this position requires. I thrive on deeply investigating all sides of an issue. That's what I did as a producer, as an advocate for my son. 
And evaluating a complex issue, breaking it down, and coming up with a plan. So um, I would be honored to serve on our city council and advocate for my district's interests and those of Tanglewood as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Liebert. Uh, next, we want to hear from Athonio Sierra. Mr. Sierra, please come on up. Wow, um, you guys are really having me do something that I really dislike doing, which is talk about myself. So, um, thank you very much, everyone, for for coming. So, a little bit about myself. Um, I've been in Denver since 1991. Um, I grew up in Northeast Denver. Uh, went to Montbello High School. Graduated in 1998. Uh, soon thereafter, I uh, attended uh, the University of Colorado, graduating with a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Admin. Um, and soon thereafter, I um, went straight to work. Um, after a couple of odd jobs, I started working for a company called IHS in uh, 2004. Um, I bought my house in Inglewood in 2009. Uh, really loved the area. Uh, the proximity to downtown and DTC was a big selling point for me. Um, and I also have a five-year-old son. Um, he's currently a kindergarten at Charles Hay, uh, which we love. It's so close. We can walk. We can bike uh, to school when the weather's nice. So really enjoying it. Um, so in terms of my free time, what I like to do is um, when I have it, I like to run, I like to cycle. Uh, two, of my, two of the biggest things I like to do, and part of the reason for that is I like to set goals for myself at the beginning of the year. Um, every, year I, every year I challenge myself in something a little bit differently, and uh, this year I plan on running a marathon, um, which would be the first time I do it, and probably be the Colfax Marathon in May. A um, couple other stretch goals for me personally would be, uh, surprisingly, I don't know how to swim. Uh, so that's one of the things I want to do, and then, uh, but the sole purpose of that is because I want to do a half Ironman um, later on this year as well. Um, so in terms of my pro uh, professional career, like I said, I've worked for IHS. It's been 14 years, or will be here in February. Um, and so what I do at IHS, I'm a, an account executive, and so what I do is I work with a lot of the Fortune 100 companies with the goal, obviously, of uh, uh, growing the business with them. So you'll see me working with a lot of aerospace and defense company, technology, uh, diversified industrials, automotive companies. And so I work with a lot of um, uh, folks in engineering, design, obsolescence, sustainment. And really what I do is I really just understand the requirements, understand their objectives, and see if that's something that I just can meet. Um, and the reason why I bring that up is I'm not an engineer by background. Um, I don't have that um, uh, technical background. Uh, so basically what I'm, I'm um, excuse me, so, you know, I can't really tell you what it is that they do. I I'm, uh, I'm, can't tell you much about component engineering. I can't tell you much what an electrical engineer does. Um, couldn't tell you much about the E2D uh, Hawkeye aircraft or any of the DMSMS regulations that the Navy follows. Uh, but what I do, but I, what I can do is I can listen. I can ask questions. And I have a team of experts that, you know, depending on what the requirements are, I bring them in. So whether I need a uh, material compliance expert or an obsolescence expert, or an expert control experts, I bring them in. Um, and so I see city council being very similar. I'm not going to be an expert in a lot of the topics that come up, but I am going to listen, I am going to ask questions, and I will bring in the experts and you know the uh, references from the community in order to solve some of the issues that, we're, that we have, whether it's something small like crosswalk, uh, excuse me, crosswalks on Logan, or bigger issues like the homelessness problem, or uh, uh, building, uh, excuse me, like zoning or some of the smart building initiatives that we that we have to tackle. So, um, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Next, we have Mr. Mark Hessling. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Hessling. Let's see. Uh, my parents moved us to Colorado when I was seven. I grew up in Loveland, which is a great small little town in northern Colorado. My folks are still up there. Um, I went to film school down in Santa Fe, so I went through traditional art school, which was a lot of fun. Um, I moved to Denver in 95. I bought my house here in Inglewood eight years ago, and for all the reasons that everybody's already stated on how great, wonderful little city that we all have here. 
it's great to see so many people that are interested in making this a better community that we live in. It's wonderful to have interest from the public and uh, that there's this much interest in joining the committee to make this a better town. We've got so much opportunity here. There's so much room for growth. There's so much growth that's coming no matter what we're going to do. And it's important that we get be in front of that and we take the vision that we collectively agree to as a city and move that forward. Personally, uh, I work in advertising. Um, I work for a startup. We later were in downtown Denver. We've been going for a while now and having a lot of fun with that. I've worked uh, for companies that are based here in Inglewood in my time, um, doing a lot of different jobs and a lot of different things. Um, I really enjoy the, 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 the feel of the town, the character of the town. I think there's a lot of possibilities and for growth um, and to reinforce every, all the good things that have already been done. Um, it's a great part of Denver. It's a somewhat unknown part of Denver, too. You know, and that's one of the positives in a lot of ways. But there's a lot of things that can be changed to highlight the positive elements that we have going here, um, both economically, socially, entertainment-wise, you name it. It's a great part of town. I really enjoy being down here. Um, my political interests are varied, and I've always just been attuned to the political state, no matter what it is local, statewide, national-wide. Finally, I got to a point where I said to myself that it's not enough just to pay attention. You have to get involved. You have to do something. And I saw that this opportunity was here to at least get my name involved and, and say, hey, I want to be part of what's going on here and I want to have some input in how we are doing this and what's happening and what's going on. And that's really the reason that I'm here, is because we live in, an, in, a, in a great place that we can have the opportunity to have your voice heard, to participate in our democratic process is extremely important. It's particip participatory government. You have to be involved. Voting is not enough. And that's really why I'm here. That's why I think that I can make a difference, is because I do care about where I'm at. I do see that there is changes coming that we have to manage properly, and that this is the place to start with doing that is right here with all you people that are wonderfully dedicated to getting this job done right. So, so thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, next, uh, Scott Danford. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Danford. I'm not a politician, but I am a dad, a husband, a business owner, a volunteer, and a proud Inglewood citizen. I'm also a neighbor who would like the opportunity to serve Inglewood community through city council. After 20 plus years in the corporate world, I decided to make that decision to work for myself, to be more present with my children's upbringing, and to be part of the local business community. I believe that I can help make a positive change in the city where I've lived for over 22 years, where I have chosen to raise my kids. I'm a proud Denver native. My dad graduated from Inglewood High School. My mom graduated from South High School. My grandmother graduated from North High School. So I'm very much about community. Like you, I want to see our city continue to grow and prosper. Getting involved at the local level is about wanting to improve things such as communication, economic vitality, community identity, and effective management of our resources, which will all help our city thrive. I will bring a fresh and positive creative mindset to council, and through my work, help us move forward in a positive way. I am passionate about bringing people together, working towards a common goal, and doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. I am running for city Inglewood City Council to make sure that all residents have a greater voice in city matters and to ensure that we are focused on the needs of our residents and businesses alike. We need policies that permit rational and responsible development, but also retain what makes our city special. We need to be smart about land use and while continuing to be business friendly. We also need to be understanding of the social issues that exist in our city and how we can better serve those in need. I believe that, that I will be doing everything I can to give back to our city and make sure that our current residents and those who come after me have all the opportunities that I did. Inglewood is a wonderful place to live 
and call home, and together we can ensure that it continues to be a desirable place for our residents and businesses alike. I hope you'll consider me for Inglewood City Council. Thank you. My name is Scott Danford. Next is Andrea Mannion. Good evening. I'm Andrea Mannion. I'm a third generation Coloradoan, um, and I've been an Inglewood resident and homeowner for 14 years. I actually have family roots in Inglewood dating back to 1931. My grandparents and grandfather's family actually lived and worked on a farm off of Santa Fe and Oxford until 1953. Um, in fact, my grandfather's brother even attended Inglewood High School and had Miss Flood as a teacher. Um, <laughs> I always remember the stories my family shared about how great of a community Inglewood was for them. My grandfather would often visit to drive by the area they once farmed. He always said it was like the best years of his life. My mom also works, has worked for the city of Thornton um, for the past 40 years in the city clerk's office. Um, so I grew up uh, listening to city council meetings all the time. Um, <laughs> back in those days, they recorded them with a cassette tape. So I have lots of memories of my mom coming home with a tape recorder and tapes, listening to the minutes over and over again. So. Um, I have a Bachelor of Science in Accounting from Regis University and a Master's in Taxation from the University of Denver. Um, I started my professional career in government actually at the State of Colorado Department of Revenue in the Business Tax Division. Um, I also worked in the Rapo County Finance Department as an accountant. Um, I'm very grateful for my government experience because it made me realize all the challenges the government faces, especially with budgeting and finding enough funds to make sure we have all the resources that our citizens need. Um, from there, I also wanted to get some corporate tax experience, so I worked at Excel Energy, and I've also worked for a large local public accounting firm in Denver. Um, after all my experiences, I, I decided to go off on my own and start my own business um, to apply what I've learned to help other small businesses and entrepreneurs across Colorado. I now have a home-based business right here in Inglewood, and I'm very active within the business community. I currently serve as a chair of the Alliance for Commerce in Inglewood board, um, which is an advisory group that supports Inglewood businesses and acts as an advocate between the city of Inglewood and the business community. I'm also a volunteer with Goodwill as a youth mentor. Um, so we work with a lot of um, low-income kids who are first generation in the US and also first generation to go to college. So I've been mentoring the same student for a year and a half through her high school senior year and well as well as her freshman year at DU. So even when they're not your own kids, they still grow fast. <laughs> um, I applied to represent District 1 because I love Inglewood, and I want this to be my home for many more years to come. I want to serve my community and bring forth solutions to help build a fiscally responsible budget so we can have the funds for affordable housing, for improving and replacing infrastructure, for strengthening and supporting the business community, for creating more resources for the increasing homeless population, and um, maybe even paving our alleys one day. Um, we can't even begin to address those issues without the funds to support it, so it all starts with the budget. Um, I would love to have the same opportunity as my grandfather did, getting to tell his grandkids how great Inglewood is. So, thank you. Next candidate is Erica Zerke. Wow, what a slate of candidates we have. I think that all of us can rest assured that whoever council appoints, District 1 is going to be really well represented. Uh, I'm Erica Zerke, and I'm running for city council because maybe I will, actually. I'm Erica Zerke, <laughs> and I'm running for city council because I want to make Inglewood the happiest city in Colorado. What do I mean by that? I want a community where people feel safe to walk around, 
where we have lots of job opportunities and housing options, abundant options for shopping and dining and entertainment, um, a place where the water tastes good, <laughs> uh, and you know, just a place where people feel like they belong. In the eight years that I've lived here, it's been a wonderful place to raise a family and start a business and be part of a truly incredible community. And I want that same sense of opportunity and support for everyone who calls Inglewood home. My husband and I contribute to the community through the business that we own, Inglewood Grand. And for me, the most rewarding part of owning the business has been getting to know our community members, all of you. Inglewood has a lot going for it. We've got beautiful parks, a thriving business community, great public transit, a really unique history, all sorts of stuff going for it. But the real charm of our community comes from the people who live here. And you're the reason I choose to live and work in the heart of District 1, and you're the reason I want to serve on City Council. What else do I want to tell you about me? I really appreciate, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight, taking an active role in shaping our community. I spent more than 10 years of my career helping people become active citizens. So at the state capitol, I created an outreach department for the very first time ever to better connect senators and their constituents in more meaningful ways. Uh, after that, at Children's Hospital Colorado, I trained doctors in how to effectively influence public policy. So I mean it when I say I really believe we are all in this together. I have really nice prepared remarks and I'm totally blanking out right now. <laughs> but what I mean is that we're all really in this together. <laughs> and um, I think that we can all agree that Inglewood is great. And that's thanks in large part to the leadership of our city council and our staff. Thank you. And um, I think that we have a real opportunity to continue to make Inglewood a really vibrant, happening place. And we can do that in a way that preserves the heart and soul of Inglewood. And finding that balance will be my top priority on city council. But I'm not a single issue candidate. <clears throat> the timer's going off. I will tell you that I am thoughtful and hardworking, and I have solid experience. And what my guiding light will be on city council will be creating the highest quality of life for the greatest number of people. So again, I'm Erica Zerke. I'm a mother, a homeowner, and a business owner in this community, and I would be honored to serve you on city council. Thank you. Last but not least, and again, there was no particular order of preference of candidates tonight. It was all on predicated on how they're going to interview. So, uh, again, last candidate is Carson Green. Not how they're going to interview, when they're going to interview. When they're going to interview, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Good description. Yes. The order of the interview. Hello, I'm Carson Green. I came out to Colorado in 95 to pursue an education and business opportunity, as well as to pursue mountain adventures. Um, if any of you wonder why my hands are torn up, I'm a rock climber. <laughs> um, I had met through a friend, a mentor, who wound up becoming my business partner the last 20 years, over 20 years. We run a small software company, and we've built applications, sold and designed and built applications for a wide variety of industries. Because we're small, I've worn a lot of hats and learned a lot of uh, skills, everything from dealing with limited resources for both our startup clients to uh, budgeting for ourselves, being a small company, dealing with intellectual property contracts, um, designing, building, supporting, maintaining complex software, software systems. I bought my house in 2000 in Inglewood and then started learning about the community. About 13 years ago, there was a similar situation with a vacant midterm city council seat and I saw a post and was interested and applied and went through this then, and um, actually, Ms. Barantine was on the um, council then. I didn't get it, but I learned uh, the person who did get it rightfully so did. He had been serving on boards and commissions, Jim Woodward, and wound up going on to become mayor. 
Um, the council at the time encouraged me to get involved, so I applied for a board or commission seat. I was appointed to the Board of Adjustment and Appeals. I served three four-year terms on that board, and I was honored for the last five to be voted by my peers each year to be chair. Um, I appreciate Inglewood. I like living here. I like being a part of it. I want to offer my skill set, experience, and time to help the community. I'm thorough, um, patient, and take responsibility. I thrive on responsibility. Um, I take the time to carefully prepare for meetings, um, find out what's important to constituents, and I am a natural collaborator. I like to work with people to come up with the best decisions that lead to the best outcomes in whatever I'm participating in. Um, whether the council decides that I'm the best candidate or not, I look forward to continuing to be involved in the city, um, hopefully on another board or commission position. Thank you. Let's thank all the candidates one more time. At this point in time, it is 6.35 p.m. Um, I would encourage the uh, residents to get with the candidates for the next 25 minutes or so. And uh, please eat cookies that Scott Gilbert hasn't touched yet uh, and enjoy them, as well as get to know who these candidates are. Thank you.
of it yet.
say, I need mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, to win for the city. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's uh, it's terrible. Right. Hey, sweetheart. I know they are awesome. Cool. Did you pick those out for her? Did you pick them out, or did she pick them out? You, you let her do that? We're literally like pulling out of one thing. Yeah, I know. Not, not really. I know. Sometimes, Farah, I'm not really as put together as I think I am. No. Mine is over in the corner. Just in case I misbehave. Member, councilman. <laughs> Anybody who calls me, regardless of what is
You'll get all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are almost at 7 p.m. I don't want to interrupt your conversations, but the first interview starts in four minutes. So in fairness to that candidate, if you could, please uh, move to the atrium and continue your conversations. We totally encourage that. But we need to clear the room so that the interviews can begin. Thank you.
then when his went off, we're doing the white house. It's like, oh, that's my travel alone. No, you're not. Whatever. One, two, three. Just tell me. I don't care. Okay, well, I'm figuring it out. But you've got to have the thing in front of me because I don't have to go. This is what I brought you. Okay. That works. Like Amy. I didn't print it off. I had that same water bottle, but the tiny one. Oh, nice. I have this one, too. Oh, awesome. Oh. Hey, I was just talking with um, Hi, Bruce, thank you. What, um, Bob Stevenson is my neighbor, and I didn't oh, realize you worked with him. Yeah, um, he's on uh, Keeping Wood Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, great guy. He was great. He worked for okay. the city for a long time. That's what he said. I didn't know that was. I met him six years ago, maybe, and I, I he was already retired, I think, so I didn't really know. Yeah, what he did. Yeah, he's really? working in the parks department, I think, for a really long time. Yeah, that's what we were talking about. That's us. Awesome. Even when you're questioning, I think we can do that. Yeah, he's a good guy. Definitely. But she got moved there because he dropped out. It's not a lynching, Cheryl. If you guys need a bio break, we can what? Uh, <laughs> I chill before the meeting. What does that mean? Oh, okay, serious. Oh, um, Allison is timing Scary so me. at 45 minutes. She'll wave at you because you. She'll wave at me. Why are you waving at me? She just notified the Just to go along. Oh, I think we don't have oh, to. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll leave that right here. Yeah. Um, just so that everybody knows, and I apologize for this, an employee at work had a death in the family, and I have agreed to go ahead and take and help. And then I found out that help was uh, taking her on-call stuff. That's why I have a computer set up over here, and if the notification goes off, I do have to go over there and make sure that they take care of whatever business. It would have had to have been one of the three nights, and so I just thought I'd get it out of the way. I apologize. It is not intended to throw anybody off or do anything. I will as quietly as possible go over there. I don't need to speak to anybody. And if anybody thinks that it's too much of a disruption to their, then I will do something else. But hopefully, so far it hasn't gone off, and I appreciate everybody's patience. It's a lesson in that life happens also when you're on council. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank, okay. you sure. your right. <laughs> thank you for your understanding. All right, thank you very much. They're okay. I'm sorry. Um, Thank you for coming, Hillary. It's a pleasure to have you this evening. And we're just going to get started. Um, the city attorney is going to be our timekeeper. We have 45 oh. minutes. Um, and then when the 45 minutes is up, you know, you'll have a few, a minute or two to finish up um, if we're still moving on. So sure. with that, um, we're going to turn it over to Council Member Olson with the first question. Great, and you've seen them, so you're not. <laughs> so, <but> what? <laughs> just a reminder to you and the public, so um, it's sort of an open-ended. What, what qualities, characteristics, or vision do you, and vision, do you believe you have that make a compelling case for you to be the District 1 Council Member? And give us examples of that, if you can. Sure, thank you. Um, in my work with a little help over the past six years, I've really been able to hone a lot of my skills and uh, take on many different roles. I started actually as the administrative assistant uh, and I'm now a full-time um, director at uh, the organization. So, you know, through that growth there, I, you know, learned the ins and outs of our strategy, our finances, um, growth. We've done, a, we've grown from four neighborhoods to four counties um, and that really has been kind of our brainchild. Um, so it's been really exciting to be a part of that and, and to play many roles in that way. Um, I also do our grant writing and um, bookkeeping, those kind of things. Uh, as far as characteristics, um, I know that I have the hustle and the grit to, to get things done and to see things through to the end. And um, I work really hard. My work ethic has always been high. I, um, I have my master's in public health and um, got as close to a 4.0 as you could get during that. And um, I also see myself really as a, as a connector. Um, I really want to make those relationships and connections in the community to get people the access they need, the resources they need, to, to put them in touch with the people they need to be in touch with, um, those kind of things. And that, that all really was built um, um, through a little help and in starting my own LLC in Englewood, um, doing bookkeeping and budgeting for Mayflower and a few other clients. Um, so learning those ins and outs as well, I know um, we can talk about the budget a little more uh, later, but having that experience I think is really important too to, to bring to decisions on the council. Um, 
and I think decision making and problem solving is a huge piece of, of what you guys are doing on a regular basis, just learning about um, what's going on with the city and you know proposals are being presented and, and taking that information and, and your own outside research to to make informed decisions on behalf of your constituents and that's just such an important role and um, it's just really important to know to know to fact to gather and, and get everything together to be able to make informed decisions and have that kind of intuition on on how to make those decisions so um, you know I'm really excited to have the chance to bring the skills and experiences that I've had over the past um, well many years um, I've been volunteering and working you know since my teen years and um, to bring that here uh, to be a voice for for district one so. anything particular about vision that you have for yeah oh sorry <laughs> Yeah. I like how all the questions are multi-questions. Yeah, no, multi -questions. Some of them are a little bit longer than they should be. Yeah, no, I'm sorry to, my fault. <laughs> to gloss over that. Um, my personal vision is to, to be a community builder, and my entire career has, has built upon that, and education, and everything that I've, I've done and live into is building community and, um, and making connections and strengthening community. Um, and I, I do see that as a vision for, for myself and for Englewood uh, as a city. And uh, we can talk more about kind of smart development as well. Uh, we are a growing city. Uh, and like I, I talked about earlier, I really don't want to leave people behind and um, get people to be more invisible than they are as, as growth is happening. So um, making sure that we're growing in a smart way, um, that we're bringing um, business opportunities in and being business friendly but doing that in the in the right way so that we're all um, we're all thriving through that and not um, leaving people behind uh, so that's a big big vision I see in some of the decisions you're making here thank you thank you um, what do you think the city does well I'll ask you each part okay part um, Englewood is a wonderful place to live. It is. It really has a unique feel. It has a, a small town, working class community feel, and I, I think that's one of its biggest strengths is is the people that live here and the spaces that um, that we've created. And um, having that uniqueness and keeping it, I think, is so important. And this kind of part of the other end of the question, and making sure that we um, we keep that. Uh, vibrance and unique quality about Englewood. I, I'm so excited that I get to live here. I, when I was looking to buy a house, I, I chose to live here because I knew um, what a great city this, this has been and, and will become. And uh, you know, it's people like the council that are helping make, make sure that that happens in the right way. Uh, and it's just wonderful to potentially be a part of that. Um, and making sure that that small town feel, um, but having those you know urban conveniences and amenities tie together well. So, what are the assets? What are Englewood's assets? I think the people and the places, and um, I think it being so um, open to new opportunities with um, business partnerships and um, bringing people in, and um, people like. The folks on council and you know our constituents uh, really bring bring their own assets to the table and um, have helped Englewood grow. And it really, somebody mentioned you know it's growing regardless. And I think um, you know we're doing it the right way, and um, it's important to keep keep that trend. What can Englewood do to improve? Uh, to make sure. Um, sorry, <laughs> in my preparation, I have this all kind of together. Um, I think. Improving to make sure that we are um, really spotlighting and um, getting folks out of the shadows that may feel that they're being passed by. Um, I see this a lot at A Little Help. Um, there are seniors who feel invisible and are becoming more isolated on their own blocks. And uh, I think it's a it's an opportunity to make sure that we're we're bringing those folks with us um, as we grow. Um, but it's also a danger if we're not. Um, so it's just something that needs to be kind of present as, as we grow. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Or Hillary. Hillary. <laughs> You're fine. 
Okay. Um, give us an example of a time when you had to work on a team to accomplish a goal, and then were and there were vastly different views of that goal or how to get there. Tell us what you did, what was accomplished, and what you learned. Sure. Thank you. Um, so in growing with a little help, we. Uh, Growth is not always easy. We've been working um, in Salida and Chafee County with a group of wonderful neighbors who have become our kind of branch team to help us as boots on the ground to um, to start growing in their neighborhood. You know, they came to us and, and knew that this was a model that would help seniors to age well in their homes and leverage is an important resource that we all have, which is uh, good neighbors. Um, what we ran up against um, as, we, as we started was a, a feeling and a and a small town kind of rural sensibility of we can take care of our own, we, we don't need um, an outside influence to help us um, to, to care for folks that are here. Um, and we saw that, you know, that some of the seniors that were signing up um, to receive services were, you know, had generations of their family in Salida um, underneath them, their kids were there. Um, but they were embarrassed to ask their kids for the ride to the doctor or to the grocery store. Um, so we, you know, on a community level, really worked through um, finding kind of what the, the fears were and where um, kind of the pieces of pride that um, were pushing against what we were doing were coming from and, and really made sure to have respectful and open conversations with the folks who um, were reticent to accept a little help. and. Um, you know, when we, by the end, you know, we learned a lot from them about um, where we needed to be and um, what the organization needed to look like there. Um, I think a lot of, there's a lot of difference in each in each county we're in. We're in um, Denver, Jefferson County, TV County, and Delta County, so those are all really unique areas. Um, so we, we learned more about what, um, what Salida needed and what we needed to compromise on and, um, through that process, it was actually really um, community and trust building to have gone through kind of the aches and pains, the growing pains, uh, really helped us all get to the same spot um, where, you know, those folks were then signing up as volunteers and, and took us as their nonprofit. Um, so we didn't want to feel like, you know, the Denver nonprofit coming into Chafee County. It's really a grassroots organic movement of neighbors in Salida who are then taking care of their own, and we're just helping facilitate that. So. It was, we've been working there for um, almost three years and have been growing and have a lot of community support and, you know, we're really glad to get through that process together and, and like I said, it, I think that having that <coughs> conflict at the beginning helped us get to where we are now and, and be a stronger team in the end. Okay. And do you think that can help you on council um, work with uh, different personalities and getting to a common goal. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, we're all here for the good of Englewood and, and starting with that as a base, um, we can we can get where we need to go. Um, I was here for the, the presentation about, you know, what makes a good council or board, uh, and I just found that to be such a great presentation, especially going through this process. Um, you know, it is all about uh, clear communication, respect is number one in any conversation. Um, and, you know, knowing that we are working towards a common goal for, for the constituents, you know. It's not about the ego I. It's about getting things done for Englewood. Um, and I think that's really powerful and it happens as a team. So <coughs> important. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember <coughs> Berentine. Um, I'll ask mine in parts, too. I take um, Councilmember um, Wink's lead there. Uh, describe what you think are the key responsibilities of the role, of the council role in representing District One, and specific to District One. Sure, I, I think District One is is unique. Um, we have a lot of small businesses um, and a pretty big geography that's got a diverse um, population. So it really is important to to be a voice for everybody <coughs> there. Um, I want to learn more about what District One wants, and I want to bring that to the table. Um, like I. Like I said, it isn't. It isn't about me. I'm. It's about being a vessel for what uh, and a voice for for your constituents, which I I think is really important. Um, I know that it is a a 
significant commitment, and um, I, I'm really impressed we had such wonderful applicants and uh, excited that no matter what happens, Englewood is going to be in good hands and, and already has been. Um, I don't remember the first part of the question. I feel like I didn't answer it all. <laughs> oh, no, that was, I mean, if, if you're done with, with that part, the second part of that was what kind of time do you think it would take and how would you utilize your time to understand and represent that district well? Absolutely. Um, I know it is It is a significant commitment. Um, I, was, I spoke with uh, now Judge Jefferson uh, months ago about um, this process and just to get a feel for what what it means to be on council and um, you know aside from the meetings there's significant research um, that needs to be done in preparation and I think it is really important to be prepared for those meetings um, and be ready to, to have learned what you need to to offer an opinion um, I also think you know I love that um, Judge Jefferson did his monthly um, talks uh, at the Twin Dragon and that's actually how I got involved in the first place um, last uh, spring and um, I think it's so important to have those regular touches with constituents and especially in this really unique um, process and position I think right now that the transition is going to be really important um, so if I became our city council member I really want to make sure that my constituents know me um, know that they are being heard uh, I'd like to start kind of a weekly office hours kind of coffee get to know you um, to start and then um, probably move towards a monthly meeting but um, you know I, I want to put in the time to know my district to know my constituents um, so that they know me and feel comfortable you know sharing their um, successes and challenges with me to bring to the table I only had a two-parter there one. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh and I do actually have one more point um, sure. my my boss, who you guys met last week and, and probably before, is the pastor of Mayflower Church as well as the executive director of A Little Help. Um, and he is on board with my participation in this as well. You know, we are committed to bringing A Little Help to Englewood and um, kind of having, having that blessing from my boss, I think, is important too because he knows that there is a time commitment and um, knows that this is an important way to be spending my time. So just an addendum. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lenz, thank you for applying. Um, this is quite a commitment from everybody. I appreciate it, and everybody put their stuff out there tonight, and I know that, that uh, it, it's a bold step for doing so. So thank you for doing that. Um, my question, it is a single part. There are uh, some components to it, though. Um, <laughs> there are many issues that challenge the city at this point in time. Creating a sustainable budget, infrastructure needs that outpace city revenue, rising housing costs, homelessness, drug, and other common urban crime, maintaining quality of life with increased population and development, to name a few. What two issues are you most concerned about and what ideas do you have for addressing those? And I will uh, encourage you, as I will with every applicant, if I have not named two that you find to be at the top of your list, please wander outside the question. Oh, thank you, sure. I know um, in, in your discussions yesterday, you were mentioning that it's important to, to talk about the budget and um, I do think that's an important role um, for any council and for any city to make sure that there is a sustainable budget. Um, I, I, my experience as a, a bookkeeper and the, the person who writes the budget for several organizations, uh, I think, helps me, you know, to bring that experience to the table. I know what I'm looking at when I'm, you know, into the P&Ls and the balance sheets and, and things like that. Um, and I'm also. Uh, you know, I, I can understand, um, you know, the building blocks of a budget, but also the, the more holistic view. And I, I, I think it's really important. Um, I think it's a really important process that you guys go through, and I know that your binders are <laughs> very large. Um, and I'm, as a grant writer, I, I tend to be, I guess, an optimist on, on budgets because I see opportunities and I um, want to, to grow the revenue in that way. Um, but that being said, I've never worked for an organization um, where we've spent more money than we've brought in. Um, you know, it needs to be a balanced, sustainable budget. Um, an exciting part I, of our budget is, is the sales and use tax, and I see that as a huge, huge opportunity. And I think as we grow um, our offerings to the community, we're growing that tax. And, um, you know, I think it, it all kind of builds on 
everything, right? Englewood is, is wonderful and becoming more so, and that attracts businesses, and that attracts people, and they're spending money in our um, businesses. Um, so I see that as a really important uh, piece of the budget that um, I guess you can have more control over than others sometimes. Um, so something certainly to, to focus some growth on. Um, but again, making sure it is a balanced, sustainable budget, I think, is, is really important and not getting to those cliffs. Um, and I've, t I've talked a lot about, um, you know, the rising housing costs um, in, in kind of a long way. But um, keeping, keeping seniors in their homes and keeping folks in their homes is, is um, the most affordable option. Um, and that's why I am so excited and uh, committed to bringing a little help um, to Englewood. And we already are serving dozens of Englewood neighbors now, but to really, with an intentional effort, bring our services to Englewood and um, help folks to remain in their homes. Um, we're not at home all, at all costs. You know, there are folks who get to the point that they need to transition to the next step. Um, but sometimes it really does just take a little help to keep people safe and healthy and happy in their homes. Um, and especially in Colorado where, um, uh, you know, the state taxes, uh, or not state, property taxes for seniors are um, so forgiving. Um, I, I think it's just, it's a really important piece of the puzzle um, as far as rising housing costs. And, uh, you know, the social piece I, I think is so important. You know, rising housing costs mean people are moving here um, and changing some of the social tapestry that that is and, and was Englewood, and to really make sure that uh, we're honoring that history and um, bringing everyone forward in growth, uh, I think is is really important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for applying and being here tonight. I also have a two-part question. Uh, what would you say are three of your greatest strengths, and please provide of examples of those um, in your life, in real life? Sure. Um, one of them, off the bat, I, I am a hard worker. Um, I am I'm going to get the job done, whether it's big or small. Uh, at a little help, we have service Saturday events um, in the spring and fall. And usually it's about six Saturdays in a row that we're up, up and out there at six, 6.45, setting up tables, setting up coffee, getting everything ready, which um, is after, you know, weeks of preparation, scouting homes and... Um, as a background, Service Saturday helps with yard and home chores um, that are seasonal. So washing windows, raking leaves, that kind of thing. Uh, we serve typically around 60 homes with um, two to 300 volunteers. So it's a big, a big undertaking, um, and it, it's starting to feel kind of like a pop-up shop, right? We, we've got it down so much now that we're, we're getting everything up, we're getting the volunteers in, we're getting the waivers signed, uh, we're getting them to their, to their assigned jobs, getting the tools checked out. Um, and, and getting them onto a meaningful, um, a meaningful volunteer opportunity. Uh, and I think my hard work has really shined through those events. Um, you know, being there, being the first one there, setting up the tables and, you know, picking up the coffee and um, just really kind of grinding through several, um, two months usually of, you know, early Saturday mornings on top of our, on top of our, um, work week uh, and some you're you're doing every job right you're checking in the volunteers and sometimes you're you know making sure the porta potties get delivered and things like that there's no job too too big or too small uh, and I I think it's important to have the humility I guess to um, to work hard and, and get things done no matter uh, what the job may be <laughs> um, another strength I think I would bring to the council is that I um, I am a big thinker and also a small thinker, so uh, you know I can see the bigger ideas and the bigger vision and understand a more holistic picture. Um, but I'm also very task oriented and um, kind of detailed and organized, and um, am the get things done person. <coughs> I think those pieces together um, would be a really helpful strength to have on the council. Um, and I know there's a learning curve, um, and I. I I know there's a steep learning curve just from listening at, to remarks um, at Judge Jefferson swearing in yesterday. It sounded like a, a long learning curve. Um, but I am willing to put in the time and, um, and to put in the, the time behind the scenes to do that research. Um, it's been wonderful coming to, the, to all the meetings I've been able to since um, 
being interested in running and, and just seeing how the council operates and um, to hopefully be a part of, of that team. So. Okay, great, thanks. And the second part of the question is, what would you say are two areas of growth for you personally, mm -hmm. and how would being on council contribute to that growth? Mm -hmm. I have had a hard time in the past um, delegating some of the things, like some of the systems I've created. It's been harder to you know, let go and, and give to the next person. Uh, and it's something I've been learning more and more at a little help, and I, I think here um, especially, um, there's a wonderful, talented, capable staff um, behind what the decisions you're making and, and just kind of getting getting the emails out and um, scheduling and coordinating and um, being able to um, to make those delegations and not um, hold on to it or um, oversee it too much uh, I think will be an important um, growing experience for for me here and um, and with a little help as we're growing our staff you know being able to hand off more tasks um, and then another would be um, I kind of counted that as two, but I realize now that it's really one. <laughs> it's okay. Um, <laughs> um, I read a funny article that um, people who are usually they're right on time are optimists because they think they can get so much done, more done in a given amount of time than they're actually able to do. So sometimes I'm too much of an optimist with my time and that I think I can get so much accomplished in a, in a smaller amount of time than it takes. So I'm, I'm learning to uh, a lot more time for um, what I need to get done, and I do think that's uh, an important thing that I'm learning and working on is to uh, just adding, adding an extra half an hour to everything. <laughs> Smart, smart. Council thing. could take that lesson too sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think you want to subtract a half hour from <laughs> Yeah. Five or six hours. Yeah. yeah. But you can That's that. true too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any questions that we haven't asked that you think we should have? So, one question that I, as soon as I heard or saw you guys discussing that question, it, um, one that I like to ask um, when, I, when we're hiring or um, bringing on volunteers is uh, what's not on your resume that you're proud of um, and just want to share. And I, I mentioned briefly in, in our, our quick pitch, but um, I really do live into um, what our mission is at A Little Help, connecting neighbors um, intergenerationally. I find that to be so valuable. Um, I, I saw many people in, uh, in school you know, in college and things like that, you're in your young adult bubble and you don't know anybody outside of that and you just get really myopic. And um, like yesterday, Park Ramsey, eight years old, one of my best buddies, uh, he actually came to, to Joe's uh, swearing in and, and gave me a big hug. And um, I, I find it so valuable to have friends of all ages um, or and just be in connection and contact with those people. Um, Mary is uh, my 96-year-old friend, and I, uh, she was living in her home for decades, uh, and her daughter actually owned her home and um, needed the home and, and uh, needed to uh, help her move, So, um, but was pretty absent from that process. So I, uh, I took on a big, a big part of that um, process, uh, making sure that we found a place for her to live that was acceptable and wonderful and had what she needed and negotiating down some of the, the costs uh, for her and finding her a new doctor near to where she lives so she can get her health care more easily and um, helping her with a garage sale where you know I got her record player and things like that and she really kind of lives on in my house right now uh, and I'm actually taking her out for her 96th birthday on Thursday so um, I just I just find it very valuable to uh, to know and love your neighbors of all ages, um, and that's I guess what I would ask myself. <laughs> okay, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, um, thank you. Does council have any more oh, yeah. questions they would like to ask, yes. Linda? I, I got do. some free time. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we we we'd hope we would have some time like this. I um so you asked you. You made a couple of uh, comments about sustainability and budget. Have you ever mm. been in a situation where you've had to cut budgets or, I mean, nobody ever 
<laughs> gets to add unless they have extra money. But you have ideas on right. how you would bring in more revenue or what you think Englewood could do to make itself more sustainable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been lucky to be working with mostly growing budgets, but they're usually growing smaller than the need. Um, you know, then I could I could write a much bigger budget. Um, so it is really about making. Um, prioritizing and making decisions on, you know, what's really needed and in what, you know, amount of time. Um, and on the revenue side, I, bless you, I do, um, I, I do our grant writing and a lot of our fundraising and things like that. Um, so I definitely have that mentality, too, to look for those opportunities um, to see where we can bring in more um, so that we can utilize it to, you know, the best of our ability. And to, you know, there are ways to, to stretch your dollars and, you know, getting bids on different things to make sure, you know, we're paying the best price and um, just being conservative and frugal with, with the budget, I think, is important. I, I think a part of that, I mean, you mentioned earlier about sustainable budgets and that the growth that we have should help with that and seeing more revenue come in and then you mentioned it has to be smart growth. So what does smart growth mean to you? Yeah, good question. I'm sorry I didn't elaborate before. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to look at these questions of, of land use and, and um, zoning and things like that um, within context. Um, you know, nothing's operating in a vacuum, so making sure that these decisions are holistic and that, um, you know, things are being considered like from the environmental and social impacts and um, just making sure that, um, I guess it's a well-rounded and well-researched um, decision. Mm-hmm. Um, Council Member Barentine. I think one of the hardest things is to have to tell people no. Mm -hmm. I mean, I volunteer a lot, I do a lot. I mean, if I could do a lot of things, you know, but we are not always capable of either the time or the uh, ability to go ahead and make things happen. Mm -hmm. Not only for the constituents, but there are times we have to tell staff no too. That, mm -hmm. um, and if you could give some examples of when you've had to, as much as you would have liked to have seen something done, or as much as you thought it was a good idea, or whatever. So not focused on the idea itself or the validity of that, but for whatever reason, the answer was no, yeah. how you handled that and how you think you would handle that in this role. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, certainly dealing with volunteers um, and staff, it's important to be able to to say no and to set meaningful um, expectations uh, I think that's a huge part uh, I've worked with folks who uh, were on a part-time basis and and wanted to grow their time and grow the income that they were making uh, and it just wasn't the right time yet you know we weren't at that point yet and, and some of that is kind of helping grow their own role and revenue um, so I think the, the piece about managing expectations is, is crucial so that everybody's on the same page, you know, you're communicating respectfully um, and you're, you know, you're explaining that resources are scarce and, um, you know, if, if we spend on this, then we can't spend on this and to, you know, to put the bigger picture there um, and not just say no um, without the understanding behind it uh, and to really kind of set those expectations from the beginning. I find a lot of um, conflict and confusion comes from miscommunication and not setting expectations or being or starting out on on different expectations um, so just being really clear with that kind of thing um, can alleviate some of the more difficult conversations um, and when you're having them to make sure you're you're realigning those those expectations and 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 know that you're all rowing in the same direction and working for the same goal thank you Mar Martinez. Um, so this position is for a District 1 representative. How do you anticipate that you would balance the needs of District 1 um, with the needs of the entire city? Mm -hmm. I, and again, I think this is, this is my listening and learning piece. I want to I wanna know more what District 1 specifically um, needs and wants, um, as well as the city of Inglewood. Uh, I, I think you know, when you are in this type of position, you are speaking for your constituents. So, so representing District 1, I would want to understand, um, you know, on a given issue, what kind of the, 
majority of the district wants to have happen there for the, the city at large. Um, so I, I really think it's important to uh, to kind of balance that and to to, to learn and listen. Um, and I, I do think it's so important to make the time to listen and be out in the community and say, here's where I am at these times or I will come to you at this time and um, just be ready to, to learn. Okay. Yeah, because sometimes the needs of the districts aren't necessarily particularly directly reflected by the rest of the city. So sure. just was curious about that. Yeah, I, uh, I think again, considering the context and um, not necessarily making decisions just for a short term, um, some short term gain that, that <coughs> gain that isn't um, including the, the long term vision. Um, I think it's just really important to to get all all the information that you need and um, and if there is a decision that needs to be made for the city of Englewood that, that the district um, is not necessarily in favor of to to have those conversations with the district and explain you know how that decision was reached and why um, it needed to go that way so another example of communication I guess yeah it's important thank yeah, you yeah absolutely thank you any more questions from council Councilmember Wink, um, what do you feel council can do to um, support affordable housing in the city? Great question. Um, I think there are opportunities. Um, I haven't looked into that incredibly right now. Um, I know that ADUs have been a a big um, topic that might might help with some of some of the rising housing costs and. Um, things like that uh, and I think that's an important uh, issue to look at I know people kind of fall on on both sides of that um, I think you know in in new building when we're bringing new condos in or developments and things like that to to make to make sure that we're thinking that way that there are opportunities for affordable housing uh, within those options and um, that not every new structure is just um, you know a four hundred thousand dollar condo or something like that um, I think you know it's important to to bring that to the table as you're making those kind of development decisions thanks council member question uh, I'm going to build off the uh, questions of council member Olson and council member wink um, let's say there is a, a hypothetical development and it is in district one mm -hmm. and you have heard more opposition than you have support and let's say substantially more opposition than support but it's a project that you personally support you think mm -hmm. that it does uh, fit the neighborhood well would be a good development uh, would you go with your inclination mm -hmm. uh, which would be against the majority of what you've heard from constituents or would you follow the um, what the majority of constituents had informed you on which would be opposition to the project right um, that's a really good question, and I, uh, I certainly haven't been opposed with that as I'm not on the council yet, so um, that's a really good question. Good, because um, there isn't a project. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Um, I would want to understand why the constituents were not in favor of it, um, so kind of get more to the, like, I, I don't want to hear just no, I want to get to the need of, you know, why no. Um, and to understand why I would be why yes, um, and to see, you know, if there if the constituents are worried about it for uh, for some reason that might just be um, like a lack of information about the project that I had that information, um, then I think I would make the decision in opposition of of the district. Um, but otherwise, I I mean I'm not coming with an agenda um, I want to make Englewood the best city that it can be um, and if my constituents don't believe it's best for them I, I would really need to take that into account as well um, that's a that's a very good one <laughs> I'd well, really I really want to I force the answer miss lens um, so you and you've had those discussions and you've met with the opposition and yeah. there are folks they just do not want in their neighborhood and you're just hearing that much louder and much more frequency than you are support. Mm -hmm. um, but in your heart, you still like the project, and you're going to have to make that decision one way or the other. This is hypothetical, too. So right, right. Really are. Do I? I think it's stone now, but which way do you go on that? And I believe that it will make Englewood better. It's, it's what's right for your district. In your heart, you feel that that is the correct decision. 
I don't know. That's a very good one. Okay. Thank um, you. Thank you. It's difficult. It does happen. <laughs> I, I absolutely believe that it happens, and um, I, that's a very good question. I think I, you really need to know why it would be um, better for your district, and if you're not able to communicate that with your district, um, I would need to work on that too. That's that's a good question. Yeah. Thank you. And I, okay. I look forward to learning more about it if I it, come it's into not that. Easy question. Question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank Council you. Member Berentine. Kind of along that same vein, then maybe it would be a little easier if you could name something that you were strongly in favor of or strongly opposed to and ended up changing your mind mm. and why. That's a great one. I, I mean, I, there are many small instances of me learning new information or understanding another side and and coming around and you know either switching my opinion on it or you know coming more towards the middle um, I don't have a a quick example of of being very strongly um, supportive of something and then completely <laughs> getting the other way but I, I I do think it's really important to to be open to information and, and other people's opinions um, and not be, you know, just set. Um, which is not to say, you know, not having the courage of your convictions and things that you care about, um, but being uh, pragmatic and open and um, having real conversations um, and not just polarizing yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Wink, did you? Nope. <clears throat> okay. Anyone else? No, in my head I'm answering these now thinking, what would I say? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we should have a fun evening together and answer yeah. some of these together. But in it, I, um, I think well, I that's did. part of the debate process in that. <laughs> we're unable, yeah. to, we're we're unable to, to simulate that, but, you know, again, I, I'm sure you'll have another chance to ask us, you know, bring up other questions that you'd like to, so. I, I um... I, I do have a question about District 1 and what your sense, you've lived there for what, a couple of years now, is yes. that right? So what's your sense about the different kinds of constituents that live there and the different kinds of concerns? Or do you think it's all fairly similar? What, what's your sense of it? My sense is that it's not very homogenous as, uh, because of the interesting um, geography of the district. You know, there are different areas and pockets and um, and you've got the stretch of Broadway with businesses and things like that. So I, I do think that there are going to be, you know, a variety of opinions and, um, you know, not everybody is going to be uh, supporting or against the same things. Um, and that's why I think it is so important to, um, to be open and to be available for people to, um, to share. Um, you know, I haven't... I haven't gone door to door because um, I did on my block today, actually, just chatting. But um, <clears throat> I think that you're going to find a lot of different um, pieces to District One, and it's a unique, um, it's a unique district as anywhere is. You know, people differ from house to house, block to block, that kind of thing. But um, I, I think there's more that unites us than divides us, and um, I think if we're all, you know rowing in the same direction of building community together um, and, and bridging those those differences, uh, we can do great things here. So. Mm -hmm. And um, we probably just have a couple of minutes. Do you have, you want to leave us with some parting thoughts or the last things you want us to consider? Uh, Absolutely, you? thank you. Um, again, thank you all for being here and for the work that you do. It's. I mean, it's an incredible commitment and service to your districts and to our city. Um, and thank you for this opportunity. I, it's such a unique opportunity to, to get involved in such a big way, and I, I take it really seriously. And I would be honored to, to be on this team to, to get great things done for Englewood and kind of continue the, the wonderful work you guys are already doing. Um, it's been... It's been a privilege to get to, to come to meetings and just kind of see how everything works and... Um, and to see where I might fit on, on the council, and um, 
you know, I, I would really look forward to working with each of you and, and learning more about you and learning more about Englewood and about um, my district. And um, I really do, I love where I live. I want to build my family here and um, I hope I can do so um, while, um, while serving the community in a bigger way. Um, and also, you know, if, uh, I, I just want to be involved. So I know we did boards and commissions things yesterday and there's a lot of really great ways to get involved in case and things like that. And um, I just look forward to being more involved in the future in, in, whatever, in whatever way that brings me because um, I really do believe in Englewood and its unique uniqueness and, and I, I just want to be a part of, of strengthening and, and making this the community um, that it is and can be. So thank you guys so much. This is an exciting process. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Putting yourself out there. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. Okay. Okay. We have a few minutes. We, break. we probably, yes, we do have a few oh. minutes to have a break. Oh, we have two minutes. Oh. So well, you've got two minutes right. more. Oh. No, and actually, we started probably a couple minutes after seven. So we still have two minutes. Anybody? Do you have any questions for us? Yeah. Um, how has this process gone for you guys? I know um, you've gone through a lot of the questions and things like that. Um, I think it's really unique for you too to have this opportunity and I guess what are you most most looking for in a compatriot to, to be in the seat at the table with you? Somebody who's on team council. We probably are. <laughs> yeah, 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 we probably all have different yeah. answers. Yeah. Team council, yeah, it can make sense. Yeah, I, I, I really do believe in diverse voices and groups and being the best way to make good decisions. Mm -hmm. Finding the process to do that well is not always easy. Yeah. So finding someone who wants to really serve but is willing to have a voice, willing to do the work, willing to take a stand, uh, consider opposing views and change their minds maybe from time to time, hopefully from time to time, mm -hmm. or maybe not have any view on anything until they get all the information. And Absolutely. So, yeah, somebody who wants to be engaged. So um, I do think it matters how people go through the process together. So looking for a good team, team angle and team council. Team council. Which like doesn't it. mean everybody's hunky dory happy kumbaya all the time. Right. And many decisions you don't need to have full consensus and you know, in the presentation about you know good councils and things like that, it's it's good to have dissenting views <laughs> and to talk those through before the vote, so people know where you're coming from and can can learn more about the issue and where True. where people are coming from. I think that's so valuable. But you only need four, and the real leadership ends up coming, and the real camaraderie and respect comes with making sure that even when it's four to three, that the other three people are heard, that all of the discussion is had and that um, all of us are, all of us as a council are able to represent the constituents who put us here. We are all with an equal vote and people who we are responsible to, to, to put us there. Even the person who comes in is going to have to run. Absolutely. Because nobody stays on this with a consistent appointment. <laughs> <laughs> You're only appointed once and for then life. you have to run <laughs> uh, right. if you wish to yeah. continue on. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's looming and, and it comes very, very fast. quickly. Mm -hmm. That'll come fast. Yeah, absolutely, two yeah, two so years. Hopefully mm -hmm. somebody that, you know, can, can do that and still understand that you want to make sure that you have a relationship so that you may be part of the three or two or one mm -hmm. didn't win an issue, but you may be part of the majority next time and yep. to have respect for the people who are in the minority on an issue Absolutely. and the, the issues heard. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Lynn's good points by Councilmember Wilson and Councilmember Bertine. Uh, and I would say your built-in optimism that you discussed isn't a bad quality as well for uh, a council to hold, which I think everybody here has, a generally positive outlook that uh, we, we can reach good conclusions and improve the city, which uh, I think everybody of the nine that apply will probably bring that as well. So yeah. uh, certainly appreciated quality. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I, really, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay.
And we have till 8 o'clock. My watch says stand. <laughs> 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 it, you have one of and I was supposed to be the 9 o'clock, and they were able to switch me, so oh, I'm glad I'm not bad. keeping you till 10. Well, I'm Your glad you don't have to be interviewed at 9. I'm That's stand. late. Stand up. Well, I'm, I'm glad for you. Stand up. Watch. You guys have a turn. long evening. Yeah, thank you. Take a deep, oh, because you're not breathing deep enough. <laughs> no, they, they, they program. Actually, we don't breathe. I hoped it would do that, like, when it really reminds me. No, I just ran just randomly? No, the standing breathe because it wants you to get in before the end of the hour. I don't do I don't yeah. do that. I can sit for hours. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, the little chew thing has to go. Let's see how I feel about it. It's two o'clock in the morning. Why did you go up earlier? <laughs> No, 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 no. I'm sure I'll be like Shmali Baby. Who cares?
I like Brain smoke. Brain hazard works on dangerous animals. Good. I was just reading an article up from Colorado Municipal League about um, animals and how we're managing them with their coding. It's an absolute change. But it's right at sunset. Oh, no. Oh, okay. So it's possible. I can't have a better word. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.
keeps moving Wait, off the it, shelf. It, it, yeah, it, exactly. So, so if I sneak in oh, yeah, the window, can I just stay there forever? Okay, council members, if you would take your seat and if you would like to join those. us Fair and just sit in one of those chairs. Okay. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oh, you're going on the public ah. <coughs> um, I, I don't, so they logged me in there. He, he can help you. Good evening, Dan. It was nice to hear from you earlier, and uh, we just welcome you to the interview. And uh, yeah, thank you for submitting an application. Um, Councilmember Olson. And my thing just, there we go. <laughs> I thought it froze up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's it's getting late, even yeah, for yeah. computers. <laughs> it was, yeah. Let it sit too long. So, so um, tell us a little bit about the qualities, the characteristics, and vision that you believe you have that make a compelling case for your candidacy for District 1. Um, and give us examples as much as you can. Okay. Um, well, the first quality I would say is. Um, Thriving on, on doing research and ex, you know, grappling with a complex problem. That's what I did as a documentary filmmaker. And um, what is it? You know, I feel like the way my dog needs to go fetch a ball for an hour a day. I, my mind needs things to grapple with and um, take apart and synthesize into something more comprehensible. Um, so, and I would bring that to the city council and I, you know, tonight listening to everybody, I feel very excited about the possibility of, you know, there are a lot of problems that I, I don't know the solutions to, but I would love to dive into them and look at models that have worked and why and why not, you know, um, and try to try to find plans. Um, I think also I'm very pragmatic in how I approach things and um, come at issues from an analytical point of view rather than ideological or emotional. Um, I really try to look at the cost of things, the benefits, you know, on different issues. What do we gain? What does it cost us? Um, and and I feel that the analysis that I, and the decisions I come to, I will stand behind and explain my reasons for. Um, and I, I think that served me as a parent advocate and in a lot of my work. Um, I do have my notes here. Uh, and I think I'm a, a creative problem solver, that I'm, I think about things from different angles. And um, so, yeah. Can, can you give us an example of the first one of the pragmatic analytic versus emotional <coughs> or philosophical? Um, from, when you've had to make that kind of a decision. And OK. Um, so um, as um, an advocate for my son and his education, um, there are many things that I, many supports that I would like for him, and I had to find a way um, within the budget constraints of the school board to find what was most um, effective, you know, what um, could be quantified as effective for him, and um, I guess this, that's sort of abstract to be explaining it, but, um, and what really fit within the mandate of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So um, being the researcher, I combed through that and knew all of the relevant parts of it, probably better than the school district. <laughs> and they would say to me, well, we can't do that, and I'd say, but it says here that you can, so you're choosing not to, and I would present the case for why they should do it differently. Mm -hmm. And um, 
and ask them what their ideas were. If they didn't like my plan, what were their alternative ideas? And you know, how would those actually um, be meaningful supports? So I, I was able to pr present um, a, a clear and persuasive case. And, and I've gotten them to do things they never do. <laughs> So that, that were meaningful, you know, and were the right thing to do, and were the right use of federal funds. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Um, <clears throat> what uh, do you believe is the city's, is Anglewood's greatest asset? Well, I think there are many, but I moved here for the neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and um, I'm a value person. I looked at a lot of stuff in Denver, and you know, the equivalent, the same house with a smaller yard cost a whole lot more in similar neighborhoods in Denver. Um, and uh, so, I came here for the community and the neighborhoods and and the house, the type of houses that there are. Um, I also think Englewood has an ideal location. We're not Denver, we're not a suburb like Littleton. We, you know, are positioned really well because everything's moving south with development as things get too expensive in Denver um, and, and, and get too congested. I think that was also part of what appealed to us was that it's not congested. My husband wanted a sense of privacy, um, a big enough yard and you know, not that we don't want to know our neighbors, but um, we want it to be quiet and private. Um, you know, we love the small businesses. Love breakfast on Broadway, my son's favorite place. Um, you know, so so that kind of small, um, uh, independently owned business that we have here. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> So <clears throat> what does Englewood do well, and what, what do you believe could be improved? And based on what, how you answer those two, um, what might some goals for you mm -hmm. be in those veins should you be, um, become a member of city council? Okay. Yep. Um, well, I think I've said some of the things that, that, that function well here, um, the, the neighborhoods. I, I have a neighborhood where um, there's a... Fourth of July parade, and um, we go to the senior home um, over by Porter, and the kids <coughs> sing songs. Um, and then we have a, a party at the little park. Um, so those kind of things are are wonderful and drew us here. Um, and and the diversity in, in many levels, economically. Um, uh, ideologically, <coughs> I appreciate that diversity. Um, and I have to confess that applying for this position, I learned a lot more about Englewood. <laughs> and I went on the websites and I saw, oh wow, there's all these cool arts here I haven't been utilizing um, and checking out. So I think there's a lot. Um, there's a lot of uh, environmental initiatives here um, for increased efficiency and um, so there's a lot that do, is done well. Um, some of the areas that I think there's room for improvement um, in the area of um, waste management we could do a lot better with recycling. We could have a composting program. I've um, you know, looked for where to comp give compost, and I would have to use my friend's name who's a Denver resident. You know, I can't, there, there was nowhere to do it here. Um, so there's a lot of our waste stream that's going to landfills that could be redirected. And um, one idea I've had is um, we, we see on our water and electricity bills what our use is, what it is relative to previous months, what it is relative to our neighbors or our house size, and why don't we see that for our garbage? 
I know I, I don't know exactly how that could be implemented, but I think if we had an idea of where we stand for a household of our size, you know, just as it does, I feel ashamed sometimes on our water use, and I don't know why with our good furnace we have the electricity use we have. But, um, you know, that kind of feedback, I think, would really change how people think about how much they consume and output with waste. Um, so also, um, crime is a problem. You know, I do feel it's a safe neighborhood, yet I've had What's people, a safe neighborhood? Englewood. Oh. No, I mean, I'm saying I do feel it's a safe neighborhood, yet I've had a homeless person open the gate and come into my backyard and then go over the fence into my neighbors. Um, I had a hallucinating person ring my doorbell at 3 in the morning. The police were wonderful. Um, so how do we, you know, and I see on nextdoor.com, as we all do, there's a lot of burglaries. So how do we make it a safer community? And um, one idea, and you know, all of this, I don't know what's already been explored by you guys, um, but <clears throat> in my looking into what is the best deterrent for burglary, it's lighting. <laughs> and um, what if we became a better lit city and um, in, in the residential areas? What if there was a way to help people have more motion sensor <coughs> floodlights in front of their house? Would that, I, 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 we may be just pushing the problem elsewhere, but um, I don't know if that's been tried or considered. Um, and um, the small business community, it's, I love that Englewood is, has an initiative to support and mentor small businesses. Um, and just how, how, well, I think there is room for improvement and um, sort of mentoring some of the older businesses and how to just um, present themselves better, um, sign, signage wise, new paint, all those sorts of things that I think just give a more um, vibrant feel to our business districts. Um, and then as a former small business owner, I feel like this, the independent businesses that I love, I worry about. And I think, how are they gonna make it? You know, they're, they're selling uh, the same thing that Home Depot is selling for, with a bigger variety. And so I'm always looking at these businesses and just thinking, oh, they should be connecting with this or that. And I'll give some examples. Um, uh, there's a um, garden store that I love. It's actually in Englewood. It's on Evans. And the woman there has been incredibly generous with teaching me gardening. And so I feel very loyal. But I think, how can they survive? And um, so I, I thought, you know, they should have, what if they had um, programs with local community landscapers and, um, and, you know, to promote the landscapers and bring more business into the, the store. And um, in that way, create a community hub in the store where people who are interested in gardening are learning more, are meeting other people, um, you know, and, 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 and feel a vested interest in this, this spot. Um, this, the store let it bead. I was really sad they went out of business because I bead. <laughs> and um, and I, I just thought, you know, I, I don't know their reasons. Maybe they just wanted to do something else. Um, but thought, oh, you know, were there ways to bring more people into that and get them excited about that craft so that a store like this can survive that I miss. Um, could they have done classes at the Englewood Y and, you know, gotten a broader um, base, I guess, of people who want to shop there? 
Um, similarly, there, uh, one Englewood resident has started a um, small grocery store on Downing Street, also <coughs> not Englewood, but Englewood owner, um, <coughs> Downing Street by Little India. And um, they sell uh, Colorado local farm produce and artisanal goods. And I think, how are they going to survive? It's so much easier to go to the grocery store where you get everything on your list. And I have spoken to the people at the farmer's market who sell things that I like and can't get during the winter and said, go talk to this store and brought their cards to the store because those vendors at the farmer's market could promote the store and the store could give those vendors business throughout the winter. So that sort of synergy um, in the business community, which I'm sure there is a lot of, but I sort of look at these businesses and um, think about how they could expand or succeed. Um, so I think that answers it. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Okay, and um, give us an example of a time when you had to work on a team to accomplish a goal and there were vastly different views of that goal or how to get there. Tell us what you did, what was accomplished, and what you learned. <clears throat> okay, um, so I think I covered some of that with the parent advocacy um, that, you know, there were very different approaches they wanted to take, and I think <clears throat> I, I got the facts, and I also sought expert advice and found out what resources were out there. And there were resources I found that the school board didn't know about and was able to um, persuade them to, to do something different. So um, that's one example. I can say as a, um, in documentary production, there's always a lot of different opinions and um, different ways to do things and you're constantly um, trying to negotiate that. Uh, I guess one example, and, I, and this isn't a, a, you know outright conflict adversarially, but um, one documentary that I worked on about the Hudson River um, there was one segment of it that I felt very attached to because I had done interviews and found the archival footage and I just loved this part. And I was a field producer on it and at the screening for the executive producer, that part of the show had been rushed through the editing, was not good, and the producer and executive producer decided it didn't work, it should be cut. and. I was crushed and you know sad for the people who had given their time and been interviewed. And I wrote a email to the executive producer and the producer saying why I thought <coughs> what I thought that segment could be, what its strengths were, how it could be re-edited, and it got back in the show and was a great part of it. I think. <laughs> um, um, <coughs> I think, yeah, that. Okay, that answers it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, specific to um, District One and representing District One, describe what you think are the key responsibilities of the council role in representing District One, and then there's a second part to this, but I'll let you answer okay. that first. So. Obviously, there's a lot I have to learn about Englewood. Um, just to be up on the issues. I read on uh, next door, people have strong opinions about different things, uh, developments and things that have happened here that I don't know the background on. So there's that part of the job for me. The other, I think, is really getting to know my district and hearing what their concerns are um, and communicating with them and you know, strategizing around those issues and balancing that with the, the city as a whole, its interests. What kind of time do you think it would take and how would you utilize your time to understand and represent the district well? 
Well, I actually don't know how much time it would take. Um, and that's one of my questions for you guys is really what is the time commitment? Um, I have a lot of time available in my schedule and would be very committed to the position, but I am curious really what kind of investment it is. I'm not a good person okay. to ask for that because I like, <laughs> I like what I do too much, so it's not. I'm sure I'd be somebody. I, I don't think any of us can really answer what the required amount of time to well represent your constituency is. I think that's kind of why we were asking you. Oh. <laughs> well. I would like to have regular open meetings with my district and hear their views and, you know, um, learn from them. Um, I know I'm somebody who will be up late at night investigating stuff on the internet of, you know, trying to find examples and models of ways to handle things that have worked. Um, and you know, available for, for what requirements there are. Fair enough, thank you. Uh, thank you for your participation, Mrs. Liebert. I appreciate it. Um, I know this takes uh, moxie for all the applicants to stand up here and speak in front of a group you don't know, and then come before this group and answer questions. And I do appreciate you doing it on short notice. Um, I think we were here last night settling on these questions. So <laughs> try when you're answering them. I appreciate that you too. gave these out ahead of time. Well, that's why it took us so long last night. Well, we, we actually did pretty well. Yeah, decided we whether we would give them to you or not. <laughs> I, I think that speaks very much to the, you know, um, transparency and openness of the city council. Very good. Um, the question I'm going to ask you is a bit lengthy, so uh, I will dive in here. Okay. There are many issues that challenge the city at this point in time. Creating a, a sustainable budget, infrastructure needs that outpace city revenues, rising housing costs, homelessness, drug, and other common urban crime, maintaining quality of life with increased population and development, to name a few. What two issues are you most concerned about and what ideas do you have for addressing those? And I will encourage you and all the applicants, if your top two issues don't fall into this category, feel free to um, give <laughs> okay. us the ones that you feel are the most pertinent at this time. Um, yeah, that's, there are a lot of issues, um, complex. Um, I think where I would be able to offer the most is around environmental sustainability. That's one of my interests, passions. Um, and I think there's a lot of aspects to that. Um, looking at wise stewardship of the land that we have here, what are, where are the floodplains, what development is at risk there, um, how do we zone for those, um, how do we um, incentivize businesses and residents to um, reduce their their resource use um, in a, you know, w without compromising their way of life. Um, and, um, you know, th and there's a lot, I, I don't know about the air uh, quality, the water quality. I would be curious to learn about this and be involved with protecting it, uh, protecting its future and current health. Um, I had a thought. Um, so one of the, um, well, we, we know that Denver does not have good air quality. And we know, um, I think it's the 11th worst in the country. Um, we can't keep, keep air in districts. So we're affected by that. Um, I, I don't know for Englewood, but I know that Denver is one of the top, um, Trying to think of the word, the heat, it, it traps heat and raises the temperature. Perfect. Yes. Um, so what can we do within our budget to address these issues? Uh, Denver's passed a green roof ordinance. I don't see Englewood having an ordinance around that, but how can we incentivize green roofs to improve our stormwater management? Um, temperature within the city um, and, you know, increase efficiency of, of buildings. Um, so 
I have different ideas around that. Um, and I, I know that Englewood is doing a lot for environmental sustainability, and I'd like to be involved in that. Um, and that some of that overlaps with planning and development, which I'm interested in. Um, and how do we zone in a way that's wise, both in terms of revenue that's needed in the city, but keeping um, different income housing, keeping cohesive neighborhoods, um, and having the in inevitable growth that we will have of apartment buildings and taller uh, buildings in the business district. So how do we zone wisely for that is also one of my interests. Thank you. And, and Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Thank you for applying, and thank you for being here with us um, this evening. My question also has two parts. Uh, what would you say are three of your greatest strengths, and can you give us examples of those in your from your real life? Okay. Um, so I think that really um, one of my strengths is empathy and the ability to connect with different people. And that served me in documentary work where I had to interview and um, meet with people from all different walks of life and very different life experiences than mine and um, have, their, have them trust me. And I feel like that sounds a little manipulative, but you know, connect with them in a way that they felt um, they could open up and felt that their story would be um, respected, respectfully presented. And um, and and I think I am somebody. I just my note here. Um, I also think that part of that empathy is being able to sense what people's different individual needs are and um, and respond to that. My small business was, I was a yoga teacher and um, owner of a, of a space where I taught. And um, I feel in that job, you know, it's, being a yoga teacher is, yes, very different from this, but, but that empathy of sort of sensing what each student's different issues were and helping them heal and address and individualize things for them. And you know that was true as a documentary producer as well. Um, and I think that would serve me in this position. Um, the other characteristic I would say is just <coughs> having an analytical mindset and being able to look at different sides of things and weigh them and hold different viewpoints simultaneously. Great. Uh, thank you. And the second part of the question is, what would you say are two areas of growth for you personally? And how would being on council help you um, towards those hmm. growth goals? Well, it, it feels like growth to step out here and apply for this. <laughs> um, <clears throat> truly, I, you know, I, it, it's easy to be um, an activist in a more private realm, even, you know, about public things, mm -hmm. but amongst friends and people I know and I feel safe and loved by. So stepping out and um, into a more public role after being a stay-at-home mom for many years, that's a, a <coughs> personal challenge um, and one that I'm excited for. Um, you know, even just this, doing this was a challenge and growth. And um, so... And the other thing that comes to mind, um, I guess, uh, I think I thought of this question more when I read it, when it was emailed to me, sort of where have I personally been challenged and grown? And I, I don't, well, I would say that it's to be an optimist and to have faith that things have solutions and will work out. And that's not my nature, and I feel like as a mother, um, and my son has epilepsy, and I've had to um, work on having faith and optimism and communicate that. Great. Thank you. Sure. Good and are there any questions that we haven't asked that you think we should? 
Now, I know as we went through this, there were things I thought, oh, at the end, at the end. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, one, one thing I, I touched on this that in, as a producer, people would trust me with their stories. There were locations I'd have to get access to, gain people's trust, and, 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 and be genuine about that. But I wasn't the person who had ultimate control over the project often and how their stories would end up being aired or whether we would really protect that heirloom rice field that we were doing a historical reenactment in that I was trying desperately to not damage, but it happens. And so I think on city council, there will be some element of that, that <clears throat> I'm working for people, I'm advocating for them, but I don't have the final say. And how do you balance that responsibility to people with realities and, and try to advocate for them. And um, so that's one um, issue. And I, I think I've said a lot. <laughs> I think we're good. <laughs> so, okay. Any Council more Member questions? Well, I'll kind of stick to one of the ones that I asked before. I, I, um, I certainly. I came from a similar background. I got involved because my son was very medically involved. Um, and that's kind of what made me an advocate. And I still describe myself very much as an advocate. So much so that, um, I mean, I really am very in, in, ingrained in that. He's 22 now and the best resume thing I could do because he's healthy and successful. So I did well at it. But I <clears throat> also found myself in some positions where I'm sure you have as well where um, you were really ingrained in something or you believed something, I mean, especially when you're dealing with all the school stuff and all of his illness. Um, could you describe something where you were really in, uh, in favor or really entrenched in being opposed to it and ended up changing your mind and why and how that happened? That is an excellent question. Um, I mean, I know it's hard for the advocate I, to give up sometimes, but... Right, right. Um, I, was, I got the things I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to think what I gave up. I mean, I, I think there have been things with his school that I have um, come to change my mind about with the homework load or certain things that I didn't believe the teachers about. Um, but I know you want something more substantial. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think I am someone and I would bring to this job I admit what I don't know, and I admit when I'm wrong. Um, <clears throat> try to keep the ego out of it. Um, and I feel sort of embarrassed. I can't think of when I've changed my opinion. But um, <laughs> I'm sure I, I have been convinced <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure. Anyone else? Well, I, I could back up on that if, if it would be a little easier. Could you tell yeah. me, I'll do the second part that I did before, and um, we all have to tell people no sometimes. Oh. I mean, whether it's staff or constituents, similar to what you said, that you don't always have control. Um, what is the hardest, I mean, can you give maybe an example as with the other question on What's the hardest being able to, to um, to come to terms with that it's not going to happen, could you elaborate on that a little bit, like that you're going to have to say no? Mm. Um, as a producer, it was always really hard to tell people they got cut from the show. <laughs> you know, um, some hist young historian whose big break was going to be being on, you know, a big one-hour show. And 
somehow when the cameras rolled, they froze and were awful, and they're not going to be in it. Um, those were hard, hard calls or letters to write um, to disappoint people. Um, You know, I think, I don't know, my policy as a mother, as a wife, is cop to things and explain why. I, you know, try to do better. And <laughs> it is hard. I don't know. I, and I think I am someone who's often, um, I'm friends with people on two sides of an issue. Or, you know, at Jason Park, there's one person who's always in conflict with people. I'm friends with her. I'm friends with the people she fights with. And she'll say, weren't they so outrageous? And I'm in that position of saying, yeah, you really need to watch your dog more. They shouldn't have spoken that way, but, you know. And I, I do find it hard to tell people, I don't know, to be confrontational, but I do it. <laughs> I guess is what I'm saying. When I, when I believe it's for a good reason. Thank I'm, you. I'm a fighter. Uh, I come from Russell. Mine's similar to. I, I love your question, um, but uh, and it's helpful. Um, sensible and, and clean or clear, or clear growth. Yeah, clean growth. Clean growth. I think you said in your opening statement. Gosh. Can you talk a little bit about what you think that might look like in a city like Englewood and what the issues would be in getting there? I think it's clear. Maybe clear vision or something. Clear vision for growth. growth. Yeah, maybe that was it. New residents and yet not pushing out older. You had some great kind of dialectical tensions you so, mentioned. And, and again, I, I need. I, I don't have the policy yeah. solutions, but I think, I, and I touched on this, you know, where I grew up, there was a lovely period where some new restaurants were coming into empty areas. Um, and there were some new stores, and it was fun and nice, and things improved. But how do you manage that growth so rents don't increase so much that only Starbucks and Banana Republics, you know, and, and the Upper West Side of New York's turned into a mall with chain stores. So how... You know, and already people are coming here, Bird's All stores that were pushed out, outpriced from Denver. So I don't know how you do it, but I think we have to have um, intentional long visions of how you maintain space for small businesses who can't afford the big store rents. We can have the Chick fil A, but we want. Um, breakfast on Broadway or whatever. Um, so I think that and how we can't control the market and the desire for big homes with a lot of square footage, but we can control the zoning so that people don't feel like suddenly there is a monstrosity on their house that has changed the feel of their neighborhood. Um, that is my view. My my neighbors, who I adore, they have two lots, and they're retired and want to sell. And I'm afraid, you know, what could be built there. So, um, and when I moved in, people were afraid of what we would do. <laughs> and we didn't, they, people across the street said, we were sure you were going to pop the top. You know, I didn't do that. But um, we all, we we're all worried about that. Um, so how do we zone? We've got to, um, there will be, there is a desire for bigger houses. So maybe a follow-up then to that is, yeah. yeah, none of us have the easy silver bullet yeah. on this whole thing. So what would be your process at getting at what you would think might be a really good decision or problem solving around that? Um, well, I think I would look at what the, you know, what the revenue is for the city from bigger development and what our financial needs are. How, um, you know, I think we, we do want some of that. Um, and where, where can we zone for it in a way that maintains the characteristics but change, you know, changes. So I think Broadway is going to change a lot. Um, some of that's fine, but how do we keep, you know, space for the small, smaller people? 
and some, you know, what would be my process? Um, I think what people resent is feeling like the developers are profiting unduly and the city's not gaining enough. And um, so I think that's part of the equation. You know, who, who's profiting from this change? And are, is Englewood getting, is Englewood benefiting financially from it? Councilmember Wink. Thank you. <clears throat> what can we do about the homeless in Englewood? So, I think there are um, different types of homelessness. I think there's mental health issue homelessness. There's economic issue homelessness that I think have different solutions. Um, when, in, you know, it's very hard to institutionalize people. My, my husband's a doctor at Swedish and he sees repeat people who drain the system who need to be institutionalized who the police round up every month and bring in because they've OD'd again or whatever. Um, and so I don't know that Englewood has the resources for that, but I think on a larger level, that is one aspect, that there are people who have mental health needs not being addressed and they're draining the system and living on the street. So, you know. Um, what could we do with, so? So your suggestion? So I'm saying mental health. There are people who can't, are not functioning on their own. So what could we do about that right. particular population? So I think there are people who need mental health solutions, long-term mental health solutions, um, hospitalization. I think there are, um, I believe that Denver does this, and there are models of providing housing for the homeless and that this is actually a more cost-effective way to manage them than they're, they're living on the street and using the ER as, for medical needs, that um, from a pragmatic financial point of view, it costs cities less to give housing than have them living on the streets and, and give support services and uh, um, uh, recovery services. So I think those are two parts to it. And um, from talking to people here tonight who are District 1 residents, um, one man was telling me how we have a much more lenient policy than neighboring cities. I don't know, but I think certainly we need to have equivalent policies so people aren't just coming here because they're being pushed out of tougher um, neighborhoods. So I think we need services for the homeless and um, in the form of mental health and um, support services for, for people to have the stability to get their life together. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, this is Liebert. Um, I like the example you gave when you moved into your neighborhood. Now, uh, the neighbors were wondering what will come of these new neighbors <laughs> and will be making dramatic changes to their property and their residence. And that uh, there's the potential on your block now that a couple of folks selling out that another um, instance where change could come. Yeah. Um, development seems to be uh, an issue that draws great passion very quickly from folks. <laughs> uh, yes. I've certainly not been on council long and I've experienced it myself. And rightfully so. Uh, people are very protective of their neighborhood and, and who could blame them for that? Um, I will put you in a hypothetical situation, and I'm, you really won't be on one side or the other in terms of um, the development. But there is a development in District 1, and uh, there is a great deal of opposition to this particular development. Um, you're hearing it over and over disproportionately from folks in District 1. There is a small level of support, um, and you happen to be in that group. Uh, you're on the side that supports um, the particular side of the project. Which way would you go? Um, there seems to be widespread opposition to it, uh, and you would be on the supportive side. Um, would you follow your instincts, or would you go with uh, would, what appears to be the vast majority of your neighbors? So I would want to know what the opposition was based on. And, you know, I feel like it's hard in a hypothetical like that. Um, if I 
you know, what, why, why am I in support of it and why are the majority opposed to it? I'm not against having a minority opinion and standing by that. I, I feel like I'd have to know what the reasons were and I might find that, you know, I'm wrong on this and, and, and or that really the will of the majority should prevail. Um, but I, I, I feel like I'd have to know what their positions are based on. You bet. I do think on some of these development issues too, though, you're for it or you're against it. You know, it, it, the plans will be outlined very clearly uh, by the developer. It will go through the planning process. And, and you'll have sides where there's some folks that they think it's a good fit in their neighborhood and there's some folks that don't. And um, a lot of times it, it, it will be, uh, there'll be two sides to the fence there. And it's a big district. I, I'll bet it <coughs> depends how close you are to that development. <laughs> Without a doubt. How close yeah. you are to the epicenter, to be sure. Uh, yeah. Again, I think the passions run even yeah, higher. But then not in my backyard, yeah. Uh, and, and I'm told her in a minute. I will leave it at that. Thank you for the answer. I appreciate it. Um, do you have any closing remarks that you would like to share with us? Um, that I would... You know, obviously, uh, there is a lot I will learn in this job, but I would like to be considered um, for the problem solving and pragmatism that I would bring to the job. Thank you. Any concluding remarks from council? Would you run? If oh, you're appointed, if I had to would run. you run for the position? In two years. In two yes. Years. Yeah. Well, a year and a half. Yeah. <laughs> I would, months. based on how it how it goes. <laughs> you know, um, okay. I would. I was relieved to realize I didn't have to run for this position, and I'm sure that's why there are nine <coughs> candidates. But um, my friends have been encouraging me to run for something for a while, and a friend in Anglewood texted me about this and said, you should apply. And I said, thank you for the compliment. But um, <laughs> then I realized I should. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And thank you all. Thank you so yeah. much. <clears throat>